name is Loie Lane, and I'm so excited to tell you guys about my new podcast, Internet Urban Legends, with my BFF, Snitchery. We deep dive into the darkest corners of the internet to uncover whether some of the most notorious web myths are hoax or whether they're con. Internet Urban Legends, available exclusively on Spotify. Hello my loves, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you are new here. Hi, hello, my name is Loie. In my previous scary side of TikTok video, we went over one TikTok in particular from a user who goes by the name of WWSCD. And this user was seemingly single-handedly taking on the task of exposing a cult that she grew up across the street from. And I said in that video that if you guys wanted an entire video about this cult being exposed on TikTok, that I would happily deliver. And so many of you in the comments section were excited to hear about it. So today we're going to be talking about the Living Word Fellowship, also occasionally referred to as The Walk, led by a man named John Robert Stevens who single-handedly conned people into giving him money, power, and created an environment that is truly the stuff of nightmares, as well as getting a first-hand look into some of the materials from this church cult straight from TikTok. On October 20th, 2022, a TikToker by the name of Ren, who goes by the username WWSCD online, posted a video. This video was to talk about pamphlets, cassette tapes, and other media that she found in an abandoned building across the street from where she grew up. That abandoned building was the home to a cult by the name of the Living Word Fellowship, also sometimes known as The Walk. To talk a bit about Ren and the TikTok account in which I kind of started to learn about all of this from, Ren runs a website called watchwhatshecando.com, which focuses on equality and empowerment for women in STEAM, which stands for, and I did have to Google this, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. What I'm getting at here is that talking about a cult was not exactly her usual content. That being said, the video garnered over 2.5 million views at the time of recording this video. A quick bit of information before I show you the video that initially went viral. The Living Word Fellowship is a Christian cult that was located throughout the United States, Mexico, parts of Brazil, and Canada over its lifetime, I guess you could say. I wanna make a quick disclaimer here that I do not believe that Christianity is a cult. What I do believe is that the Living Word Fellowship took idealizations and concepts of Christianity and twisted them to fit their own selfish agenda. And I think you'll see that pretty quickly as we go on. The cult was founded in Southgate, California by John Robert Stevens. Now, Southgate, California is part of Los Angeles County. It's kind of like just southeast of downtown LA. It is called the Living Word Fellowship, but is sometimes referred to as the walk due to the founder's belief that every Christian should have their own personal walk with Christ. Now, Ren, the TikToker who has been making these videos diving into the shady history of the Living Word Fellowship, grew up in a small mountain town in Colorado called Palmer Lake. So over the years, of course, the cult spread out from California. Again, it had its roots in Los Angeles, and a lot of what I find are about North Hollywood campuses for the church, as well as Anaheim campuses for the church. So it definitely had a lot of roots just kind of all over the U.S., especially at the height of its popularity in the 1970s. Speaking of the height of its popularity, at its peak in the 70s, it was pulling in like 100 member congregations. And many of the pamphlets and materials that she showed in her TikToks seem to come from the height of that popularity in the 70s. I'm going to go ahead and show you the initial video that Ren posted that went viral, showcasing some of the pamphlets and other media that she found inside of the former site of this cult. I did show this in a previous scary site of TikTok. If you've already seen it, feel free to skip forward. But for those of you who haven't, I think it's a very, very important way to kind of kick off your knowledge of this cult as a whole. I grew up next to a cult, and I'm about to show you the pamphlets and cassette tapes that they distributed to their members. This cult is a modern cult in America that still exists in several states. It's called The Living Word, and it was created by John Robert Stevens in 1951 in California. I'm from a tiny mountain town in Colorado called Palmer Lake. And when I say I grew up next to them, they were literally across the road from me. 
As I tell you this story, I am going to show you the pamphlets and cassette tapes, only 1% of them because, as you can see, I have boxes filled. So they were being quarantined on their property for allegations, and my friends and I decided to go look around in the abandoned buildings out there. And I did not think that what we found would be straight out of a movie. First, let's talk about the cassette tapes. Ba-bam! Do you see that? It says pastor approval only stamped on it. Do you want to know what it sounds like? That cassette tape has a recording of the leaders of this cult talking about John Robert Stevens' end. The end of the leader of the cult. They don't go into specifics of what that means, but I think we can guess. He died shortly after that cassette tape. Now after that, we explored the pamphlets. Here's an example of one. It says, but I'm only eight years old. They mailed these to their members across the nation. If you look in the top left corner of this photo, you'll see the date at which this pamphlet was sent out, which if I'm reading correctly, that says 1978. Spiritual cannibalism. Sounds fun, right? I don't wanna know what this one's about. And as if you couldn't get culty enough, they might as well just stamp it on the front of this one. Can you drink the cup? Now this one terrifies me a little bit because it's slightly apocalyptic. Total discipleship will dominate the world. Sounds like they were hatching a plan. Now this next one I think is really interesting to talk about. The channel of the higher flow. So what they called leadership in this cult was the flow. And if you were part of the higher flow, you were part of the higher leadership. I'm ready to read these pamphlets because I definitely think that there is abuse going on in this cult and it should be outed. So let me know if you want to hear these pamphlets. This cult is still alive and well and people have come forward. Ex-members of this cult have come forward with little to no avail. There's a mini documentary online, but not much else. I have so much more to share. There's gonna be another video. With titles such as, Do You Wish You Were Dead? As well as, Can You Drink the Cup? I think it's pretty obvious what we're dealing with here. Full blown cult. But the crazy thing is, it wasn't always like that. The thing about the Living Word Fellowship is that through everything that I can find about it online, and let me tell you, this is a hard case to research. There is not enough information about this cult on the internet. The thing about the cult though, is that it was less about worshiping a god at a certain point, and more about worshiping the leader. And the leader's name was John Robert Stevens, who has the most insane history of all time, so buckle in. He was born on August 7th, 1919, making him a Leo. I do watch Danielle Kersey videos. Thank you so much for asking. And he lived in Story County with his parents, Ava Catherine and William Stevens. In 1929, during the Great Depression, however, the family packed up and moved to California. In 1929, during the Great Depression, however, when John Robert Stevens was only about 10 years old, the family packed up and moved to California. And while they lived in Los Angeles, they attended the Angelus Temple, which was a Pentecostal megachurch. The church is located in Echo Park, and even at the time of its inception, back in 1923, the temple was already seating over 5,000 people. From a super young age, John Stevens was fascinated by religion and stuck quite close to his church. It was obvious that religion ran pretty firmly throughout their family's lines and it was heavily, heavily ingrained to all of what they did. So much so that when they moved back to Iowa in 1933, John's father started a church. This was called the Christian Tabernacle Church. And John not only taught Bible school at this church, he went so far as to help his father prepare his sermons. At most, John Robert Stevens at this time is 14 years old, fully helping his father prepare sermons for the church in which he has founded. Before the age of 16, John was already preaching on his own in Gladwin, Iowa. Now, he did go on to graduate high school in 1937, but it is important to know that John did not, like, have any kind of formal education as far as I can tell. I think that it was said in, like, later parts of this case that he literally had, like, a mail order degree, but no actual university 
degree or anything like that. He was ordained in the Assembly of God, which is a group of churches under the Pentecostal denomination. John went on to marry his first wife, Martha, in 1939. Her name was Martha Mickelson, and they had two daughters together, and that's really all there is on that for now. I'm kind of breezing through the details here, but I really want to talk more about the cult, and we can talk about Martha and just like John's personal life a bit later once you have like an inkling of what this turns into. So John packs up the family and moves to Los Angeles in 1946. He becomes the pastor of an Assemblies of God church in Linwood, California. And this is where things start to get, for lack of a better term, culty. See, John Stevens was fascinated by the healing revival happening in the 1950s. This healing revival is essentially like a decades-long span of those sermons that you'll see on TV where somebody like prays over someone in a wheelchair and suddenly they stand up despite being fully paralyzed. It declared itself as a signs, gifts, healing, salvation, deliverance, Holy Ghost, miracle, revival. And all of this was happening pretty much between 1947 and 1958. If you're wondering what is happening, that's a great question because it's not very clear exactly what the mission was, except, and this is according to a website that very much so supports and believes in the revival and documents a lot of it to this day, it says that healing evangelists went through America and prayed for the sick. Let me give you one small example of things that were happening during the healing revival that inspired John Robert Stevens to go on and make his cult. There was a former U.S. congressman by the name of William D. Upshaw, and William had spent the majority of his life in crutches. Over 59 years were spent on those crutches, and he became fascinated by this healing revival. William Upshaw was a Georgian congressman at that. Listen, listen, I'm currently in Georgia as I'm filming this in my bedroom uh, at my parents' house, and I love my home, but we are deep in the Bible Belt here, so you can kind of already get a picture of what I'm about to tell you about. William Upshaw is obsessed with this faith healer by the name of William Branham. A lot of Williams in this case, I really don't know why, but William Branham is literally the faith healer that like kicked off the whole healing revival. William Upshaw visits one of William Branham's services, and when he leaves, he no longer needs to walk with crutches. He was supposedly healed and could now walk further than ever without the use of his crutches. And his story was truly a testament to everyone else around him to support this faith healer, buy the sermons, buy whatever materials he's selling, get into this faith healing, which was also very often referred to as quite culty behavior. And how was he healed? We don't know. We just know that it's through the power of God, as well as the work of this faith healer who literally kicked off this entire healing revival. And stories like these are all throughout the revival's history, but it's important to know that this is kind of what's happening to inspire John Robert Stevens. The healing revival itself is sometimes also referred to as a doomsday cult due to the beliefs that they were in the end times and the world was going to end. So John Robert Stevens is pulling inspiration from the healing revival. He's also pulling inspiration from the Latter Rain movement, which is occasionally referred to as the New Order, and I feel like that's literally all you really need to know. It seemed quite similar in my research on it to the like healing revival. Now the latter rain movement, the new order or whatever, as well as the healing revival were both formally rejected by the Pentecostal church. The Pentecostal church had participated in some healing revival rituals from what I can tell, but they pulled out and denounced both saying that they were not part of the Pentecostal denomination. Actually, I said Pentecostal, but it's more so that specifically the assemblies of God rejected these things. I don't know if the entire Pentecostal denomination rejected all of this, but the Assemblies of God, who John Robert Stevens is ordained through, does reject it. And this is where John Robert Stevens is like, well, 
but I believe in this and this is part of my faith and now I have this conflict with my denomination and my religious beliefs. According to him, it's around this time in the 60s that he begins to have prophetic visions. And it was these visions and revelations and conversations with God that would lead him to establishing his very own church in Southgate, California. Originally called the Church of the Living Word, it was later known as the Living Word Fellowship. Now that you know how it all came to be, let's talk about the cult itself. I think a really good way to kick this off is by a very, very uh, harrowing quote from John Robert Stevens himself, who said that the day of individuality is ending. He went on to explain that God does not want to deal with individuality, and instead he suggested that God wants complete compliance and essentially a hive mind. Information on this cult is scarce. It's hard to research. I have spent days knees deep in this information, have bought subscriptions to more websites than I can count in hopes of scouring up some old 1970s article to get a glimpse into this cult. But they kept a lot under lock and key. And luckily for us, Ren's TikToks, the whole reason we're here, are a phenomenal and very intimate look into what this cult was up to. For example, there's this one video in which Ren shows one of John Robert Stevens' actual sermons that she found on a cassette tape. Right, amen. What I would like to see is that you have your open and closed services and understand the reason. You have open services to reach out to evangelism, but you have closed services so the evangelism will be effective. Without closed services, there's going to be an evangelism. The walk is in an impasse. Unless we have intercession, unless we have violent intercession, Santa Barbara is not going to be taken. You can pass out tracts or Gideon Bibles, whatever you want to do. It's not going to do a thing. What I just played for you was a tape with pastor approval only stamped on the front. It's called We Made Waves Dash Santa Barbara. This was filmed January 11th, 1977. Something you're gonna realize as I'm showing you these pamphlets is that they don't outright say any form of abuse or violence. Well, except maybe the tapes. But the story behind them provides the context that helps us understand what they're actually saying. In another TikTok, Ren goes on to explain that John Robert Stevens was getting visions from God way, way earlier than when he initially was talking about them in the 60s when he established his church. We pray this tape has been a real blessing to you. Because of the many requests we have received, we have endeavored to build a library of tapes, taken from a living word for this hour, of what God is speaking by the Holy Spirit. This is a faith work, and we would appreciate your prayers and offerings on our behalf, that the Lord would help us to continue to promote the Word of God to a hungry people. My possession of these documents is nothing but happenstance, correct timing and location. But with that, I bear a responsibility to preserve these documents by giving them to an archive after this research is done, as well as telling the story that I see written in the lines. This is a story of abuse on a mass scale manipulation of thousands of people. I'm hoping that these videos will serve to help people understand what it looks like when you are being charmed and deceived. As people like John Robert Stevens and Gary Hargrave are predators. Let's talk about the insidious seedling that created this cult, John Robert Stevens. Stevens became a leader of manipulation and exploitation, which can be best summarized by his own favorite quote, members would be better off standing on their heads, think less, and receive his revelation better. In this video, she mentions a man by the name of Gary Hargrave. And the biggest thing that I guess I can say on this story is that once you start looking into the Living Word Fellowship and this cult as a whole, and I'm sure it's this way for many cults, you go down one rabbit hole that leads to another rabbit hole and it is literally never ending. Because I could segue off about Gary Hargrave and his weird shit for like another hour. But to give you the most summarized version, John Robert Stevens' second wife, because he does end up divorcing his first wife, uh, Martha, we talk about her a bit later. His second wife is a woman by the name of Marilyn, originally Marilyn Holbrook. And just one year after John's passing in 1983, Marilyn goes on to marry Gary Hargrave. 
He has a crazy history of his own, was uh, kind of seemingly forced to step down as the church's head back in like 2018 after some serious allegations came out against the Living Word Fellowship. And now he runs an entire church under the name of Hargrave Ministries. After John Robert Stevens passed away, Gary would become the head of the church seemingly alongside his now wife, Marilyn. And that's just a small tidbit about Gary Hargrave. He is every bit the evil that John Robert Stevens was, but he doesn't take over until a bit later. At the time of recording this video, Ren only has one other TikTok currently alive. She posted two videos on November 4th and then abruptly stopped posting and none of her other social media is linked to her TikTok. I hope she's well and just is taking her time researching into this. I know it has to be a very heavy burden to bear listening to all of this material firsthand. So here is that TikTok. And Ren is going to talk a bit here about what I think might be the most fascinating part of all of this, which is the Shiloh compound. I'd like to also go into the seven things of priority before this whole walk with God. One, the school of the prophets. We're giving everything we can at the living word to print the books. Priority number one of John Robert Stevens is by far to me the most disturbing. He talks about the School of Prophets compound, which was funded by members funds that he exploited from them through manipulation. In addition to this, the compound was built with unpaid adolescent labor from his followers. Multiple injuries were recorded from the construction of these sites, Shiloh as well as others, which included the loss of fingers. What you have to understand about the School of Prophets, as John Roberts refers to it, what he means by that is a school literally created to enlist the children of current cult members into this cult. And he did this all with members' funds. Let's listen to him exploit his members for money to create these projects. And get your money in, because that $6,000 we don't have. And we're going to have to more or less collect some money ahead of time but I'm trying to point out that the priority is going to exist, that the money that is given will be put in a special projects fund if it's given for the School of Prophets. And I believe that one of the best supported things so far we've ever seen has been the School of Prophets books. Uh, Sister Stevens uh, is very close to the finances, and I can't explain to you what it's like to be a part of this system, to bring home a pile of checks this high, and sit for an hour signing them and realize how many thousands of dollars is involved. Ren mentions here the Shiloh compound, and this is essentially like a Jim Jones style compound, like an entire functioning society built by cult members for cult members and was only formally like burnt to the ground a couple of years ago. The story goes something like this. In 1971, an Amish farmer by the name of Harvey Bender hears John Robert Stevens preaching on the radio. And I'm confused because I thought that Amish people did not have access to technology, um, but maybe he had access to a radio and he hears John Robert Stevens preaching on the radio and he's like, wow, really like that guy. And so he goes so far as to deed land to John Robert Stevens. In 1974, John Robert Stevens and the Living Word Fellowship Church had formally broken ground for a church retreat called Shiloh, just to the south of Kelowna, Iowa. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Shiloh was a 300 acre retreat that at one point in time was home to more than 300 people. But that wasn't even a fraction of the amount of people that were expected to be there. Shiloh cost church members a whopping $5.5 million to construct and was meant to house more than 6,000 people in the event of the end of the world because this is a doomsday cult. Surprise, surprise. Members of the cult would work 12 to 15 hour days at a sawmill, hand prepping materials that would be used to build Shiloh. Former members refer to it uh, quite frequently as slave labor. It is incredibly hard to find information about Shiloh online. It's incredibly hard to find a lot of information about this cult online. What that results in, however, uh, are first hand accounts of people 
who were really there, really being the only source of information that I personally have to go on. Now, these posts that I'm about to read you come from the Cult Education website, which is a tool for educating people about cults. It um, has a lot of resources for people who were once in cults and is kind of just a place for people who are tied into a cult in any capacity, whether they were part of one or have family that were part of one, um, just to talk and share their experiences and spread information. This post about Shiloh comes from the user Recovered Finally and is dated to October 8th of 2006. Shiloh really was a slave camp. I was forced to work all day long in the blazing heat, cutting rose bushes one summer. I fainted from exhaustion. Most summers were spent like this. Wake up at 6 a.m., take a five minute shower that is timed, go to breakfast, go wait on the Lord for an hour, go discuss waiting on the Lord, get your personal list of chores, do your chores from about 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., eat dinner, go to church, sleep, wake up again. Some of the chores included weeding outdoors on the side of a pebble road that led into the entrance of the church, and it was at least 90 plus degrees, or the humidity made it feel that way. Weeding in the man-made lagoon where one year I was attacked by leeches when I sat in the sand. Serving on the kitchen staff. The dishwashing room was horrible because the dining room was already hot, but combined with the steam of the dish machine, it was 10 times worse. Scrubbing toilets and showers with a toothbrush and so forth. It was misery. I can vouch for that. So that is just one story of what happened at Shiloh. But you have to think at this point, uh, the church is at the height of its popularity in the 70s, right? Now they have an entire church retreat where members have to work from sun up to sundown. And I want to read one other post. This one is from Mir Gildia, dated June 11th, 2009. They were replying to somebody in this post, but I think that their experience is really fascinating as well. My parents met in Colorado at the Church of the Living Word, or The Walk. They were told that it was God's will that they marry. All I can say is that any organization that is associated with John Robert Stevens is going to be a strange one. My family was told by the leaders of the church that we would all be following the devil if we left the church. My dad was one of the head worship leaders. They told him that he was a prophet. They were way out in left field. I mean, I love my dad, but honestly, I would keep a very close eye on your family member that joined the church. Try to invite them to go to another church see what happens. And this was because the original poster was talking about family members being in the church. A lot of the people in this like forum were talking about weddings that they've gone to at the Living Word Fellowship churches and so on. You also have to think that, you know, in like the early-ish 2000s, this was still an alive, healthy, functioning cult. If they decide to have children, they must be very careful. When I was a kid, the church leaders abused the kids from the inner circles, the more popular families that were invited to parties and such. This was back in the 70s. My dad told me that one time they were all sitting around and talking about it. The history foundation of this cult is disgusting. Stay far away and warn your family of what could happen. Maybe even print out some old literature by John Robert Stevens and show it to them. Total quack. We'll talk a bit more about the imbalance of power, the abuse allegations, um, and the victims that have come forward with their stories about the church at the end of the video. In regards to the church compound Shiloh, that first story was all I really had to share with you. But let's talk a bit more about John Robert Stevens. Remember his wife Martha that I mentioned kind of back earlier in the beginning of the video? Well, when John filed for divorce from his first wife Martha in 1978, they had been married for a whopping 40 years and she made some pretty wild statements about his wealth. She claimed that her estranged husband operated a quote, $40 million religious empire and that his personal net worth was between one to two million dollars. This was in the 70s. So listen to what I'm about to tell you and then like really think about how rich John Robert Stevens would be today in 2022. He had five houses in California, a vacation home in Hawaii, and a farm in Washington, Iowa. Funds provided by the church were used for trips to Monte Carlo, Europe, and the Bahamas. And the only source of income that John Robert Stevens had 
was through the church. And at the end of John Robert Stevens' life, he was amidst a massive lawsuit with his family. He was fighting with his father, William Stevens. Remember him, the guy who like started a church way back when? Yeah. He does not really think that like what his son is up to, as far as what I can tell, uh, is like okay. So this lawsuit includes John Robert Stevens, his father, and John Robert Stevens' brother-in-law. Now, William Stevens claimed that his son was being referred to as Papa John by his disciples, who called themselves that, as well as the prophet, the man of God, and the door opener apostle. Now, this lawsuit was actually dropped by John Robert Stevens in 1983, claiming he no longer wanted to fight with his father or brother-in-law as he was suffering with cancer. It's rumored that Stevens was getting Latril treatments in Mexico at the time of his death. Now, Latril is not like an approved treatment of cancer. It actually consists of vitamin B17 and pretty much changes to cyanide in the body after it's processed. There's not really any clinical evidence that suggests that cyanide can kill cancer, and there's not a lot of scientific research behind Latril as a whole. So perhaps unsurprisingly, John Robert Stevens passes away uh, on June 4th, 1983, at the age of 62. I do think it's somewhat interesting because his death is kind of strange, and it's actually like reported on that it was an undisclosed illness that he died of, and some people don't know, did he really have cancer? Did he really not? Was he even going through these treatments? And then you think back to like the first TikTok that we listened to, where Ren talked about the like heads of this church talking about the end of John Robert Stevens. Now, his body was held by the cult for a whopping eight months months as they prayed for his resurrection. When that did not happen, they were forced to give his body up uh, so that it could be properly disposed of. At this point was when Marilyn went on to remarry. She marries Gary Hargrave and much of the same misconduct that had once taken place within the walls of the church continues to take place. Yes, it's a cult. Yes, they talk about being a hive mind and this doomsday stuff, but really and truly, this was an exercise of power among the heads of this church, among the higher flow, as they referred to themselves as, so that they could abuse their power, which resulted in the abuse of many, many people, many children throughout the course of this cult. There's one really big documentary that I found on this that I've referenced previously, and it's produced and written by a former member by the name of Tony Cox. Now, again, Tony Cox, dude, I could tell you an entire freaking hour-long segue about this man. Everyone who ever touched this church has the craziest life I've ever heard of in my life. Now, in Tony Cox's documentary, he gives his first-hand experiences within the cult. One thing I found so fascinating, and the documentary itself is really interesting, um, you know, Tony Cox talks a lot about his first-hand experiences within the church. He shows some video from the church. He shows a video of Shiloh, which is quite hard to find, and he just talks extensively about his experiences, but it is associate produced by Kyoko Cox. Who is Kyoko Cox? That is Yoko Ono's daughter, who she had with Tony Cox before she met and married John Lennon. That's an entire separate, just absolutely insane story in itself in which it's alleged that Tony Cox kidnapped his own daughter and it is a fact that Yoko Ono did not see her kid for like 23 years. It's absolutely crazy, but that is this entire story. It's one weird little line that you can follow that leads into a whole mess of other information. So that documentary I think is a really interesting watch if you want to get into it. The first half of it is kind of more about Tony Cox and his life and his story with Yoko Ono and stuff, and the second half really seems, well, maybe more like the 10 minute mark. It really seems like it gets into the um, cult stuff in the cult activities. There are in total five women that I have been able to find who have come out with allegations against the cult of the Living Word Fellowship. And these women make essay allegations against the church beginning from the time that they were as young as four years old. 
and their names are as follows. The first three who came out were Amber Thompson, Anaya Shahori, and Lindsay Weck. Then in addition to them, two more victims stepped forward by the names of Christina Pfeiffer and Shalom Kaples. I hope I'm saying that right. It's spelled C-A-P-L-E-S. Being able to join with other survivors, having Shalom speak up and seeing like, wow, that was all abuse and it wasn't my fault. It wasn't our fault. And I'm doing it for every victim then and now. Um, by coming forward, I want to hold the organization accountable. I want to stop them from abusing. And I want to make other victims feel safe and empowered to come forward because keeping these secrets your whole life is like poison. It is my responsibility as an abuse victim that can still file a lawsuit to file this lawsuit for not only myself and the closure of that, but also as a representation of justice for everybody who can't. I would say I stepped forward because there's so many people that have been abused and they're kind of brainwashed to think that it didn't happen. And you might not even remember that it happened. We didn't realize that it was wrong. It is wrong and it really needs to stop. I grew up in a small local church that was a sister church to the Living Word Fellowship in Bakersfield, California. And then I moved as a minor by myself from my mom and dad's home to the compound in Kelowna, Iowa called Shiloh. But these victims claim that the reality is that there are victim totals in the hundreds from this cult. The Living Word Fellowship is an insane story that I think we are just starting to see unfold on TikTok by the user WWSCD. I wanted to kind of get ahead of it all, explore the cult in its entirety, and talk about it here with you today. I don't talk about religion extensively on this channel, but I am someone who grew up in a church, and I grew up with parents who worked in a church, and I grew up working in a church. And as somebody who had first-hand accounts from my early childhood of the politics that went into churches in general, I can only imagine what conversations looked like for members of the Living Word Fellowship with other members, with their higher-ups. And it just sucks because people find so much comfort in religion, man. Like, I think that that's literally why we like it so much. Because it's a comfort and it's a belief and it brings us peace and joy and this sense of understanding about our world, our universe, our God, whatever, whatever it is we believe in. I think that religion can be so special to so many people and it can also really, really hurt a lot of people. And things like the Living Word Fellowship are so sad because it is a drop in the ocean of other cults that probably have just as crazy of stories behind it that just haven't gone TikTok viral yet. So there you have it. That's the story of the Living Word Fellowship, a cult exposed on TikTok. If you feel like I didn't get too terribly deep in today's episode, please understand that I did my absolute darndest to research this stuff. It is hard to find these materials online. And I'm excited for more videos from Ren, our poster on WWSCD over on TikTok. If she posts anything additional, which I do believe she probably will, I might make a follow-up to this, or who knows, maybe we'll do another video on another cult. But so far I've been filming this for like an hour and some change, and it just feels like I never even really got into the meat of like what this cult did, because you can't find it online, because they were very, very good at keeping it all under lock and key. I can't figure out how I want to wrap up this video because I feel, I guess, somewhat unresolved in the ending of it. I like to dig my little hands into every single corner of weird information that I find and unfortunately with this case there was literally just too many tangents I could have gone on. I guess that what I want to say is that there is a lot of danger in people as charming and manipulative as John Robert Stevens, whether cult leader or just a really crappy influence in someone's life. I urge you all to be safe, to be careful, and to heed your loved one's warnings if they tell you that something in your life may not be as great of an influence as you might think. 
I'm going to go ahead and go, but I would love to say a quick thank you to my subscriber S for being a member of this channel. S is a lovely name, quick and to the point. If you guys want to join my channel memberships, you can get extra members exclusive content, including members exclusive videos, polls, sneak peeks into future videos, and a lot more. And you can join by hitting that little join button. It should be somewhere around the screen, probably next to the subscribe button. We would love to have you. For now, thank you all so much for listening and watching. And if you made it to the end of this, thank you. This was honestly kind of a different project for me, but it also was one that I put a lot of love and a lot of time into. So I really hope you all enjoyed. If you did, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. I love you very, very much, and I will see you in my next video. Bye!